Hey, everybody. Welcome to another live broadcast of the Engadget podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar, and I'm joined with our reviews editor, Sherlyn Lowe. Hey, Sherlyn. Hi. Hey, and our podcast producer, Ben Elman. Hey, Ben. Hello. Hello. Uh, we are going to be doing a bit of a policy episode this week, but uh, it is something I think you guys will enjoy because it's all about how this administration and the Biden admin in particular are going to be facing big tech companies. And that's actually right ahead of a congressional hearing that's going to be starting at noon, I believe. So we're kind of leading right up to that. And uh, just so you guys know, this live broadcast, you're kind of seeing how we're making the show. So we won't be able to chat with you during our segments. We will do some audience Q&A in between segments. And today, since we have a guest coming in from the West Coast, Carissa Bell, um, she is coming on at 11 a.m. Eastern. So we're actually going to start in the middle of the show, starting with the tech first, which I'm sure some people will appreciate. Uh, are you guys good to go? No, really quick. Speaking mm -hmm. of the audience, uh, I just was looking at my Twitter notifications and <laughs> I always like to shout out, uh, shout out. Mark Dell and Daniel Cockaine. Thanks for setting up the Discord server. We're <laughs> <laughs> so no one going to be there. there any any nobody. Live stream Discord <laughs> now too. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. I don't think we'll look at the Discord live as Sorry, well. Sorry, folks. After, yeah, yeah. There's, there's you guys have fun. That is completely unofficial. At. We do not take any yeah, responsibility it's, it's for unofficial. what goes on there. <laughs> Not, not nothing to do with us. We're not moderating. Or you guys anything. have fun though. Yeah. Are we uh, good to go? You want to shout out anybody else? Uh, let me see. We got the usual crew. Jonathan Anderson says, happy Thursday in Gadget. Hi. Happy, happy Thursday. Thursday, everybody. I always and like doing this Thursday mornings, right? Because then we yes. were right before the weekend. It feels like it's starting early. Where my brain doesn't work on Friday. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, new regulars, Josh Sakdeva, Philip Doyle, I think it's not a new regular, but a fairly regular. Mark Dell and Danny Hogan are here. Just, you know, we see you. We appreciate we it. We see you. We see you. Thank you, folks, for spending your Thursday mornings with us. It's fun. We have like our little crew. I have my coffee cup. Uh, I have like a new Chrono Trigger coffee cup that I'm very happy <laughs> to have. And I think that it's uh, also nice that we have some people from the UK because, I mean, they're uh, the <laughs> UK used to be part of the EU, EU a couple of steps ahead of mm -hmm. us in terms of tech regulation, mm -hmm. tech regulation being what we're talking about today. Yep. That's a roundabout way of getting there. All right. Are we good to go? Yeah. We're all right. recording. My audio looks good. Yep. My audio Do we have a like backup good. going, Ben? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll uh, set up that backup. And yep. just to remind everyone uh, who's watching right now, we are going to be doing the um, middle part first. So yes, yes. Uh, it, we're going to be talking about like all of the other news from around tech. We're going to be talking about, um, you know, more pure hardware stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the policy chat is probably going to come around let's call it like 10 50 11 a.m and so if you're mm -hmm. here specifically like really interested in that um stick around because i promise around. i promise it's going to be interesting and yeah. fun but it may sound like we're just starting to set we're talking about being in the middle of the show so it's just the way i have to introduce it because it's going to get spliced up for audio okay okay yeah i got this um the backup going so yes we can finally go. actually start <clears throat> okay What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardawar. I'm Reviews Editor Sherlyn Lowe. This week, we're going to be chatting about why the Biden administration is really hungry for big tech critics, in particular, Lena Khan, who he's nominating for the FTC. And we also know that Tim Wu, the creator of the term net neutrality, is going to be joining the Biden White House. So we're going to dive deep into that in a bit. As always, if you're enjoying the Engadget podcast, please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcaster of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes and uh, yeah, share us around. Drop us an email at podcastengadget.com. You can also join us live every Thursday around 10 a.m. Eastern on our YouTube stream. Okay, I'm going to join straight into other news here. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a bit of a policy wonk now. Let's go into some straight tech news. Specifically, I want to talk about this weird thing that happened with Slack this week because they announced Slack Connect, a feature that they've been talking about for a while now, which will essentially let you direct message anybody 
outside of your organization. So for people who aren't quite familiar, the way Slack has worked so far, right, is that you sign into a specific Slack for, say, our workplace here uh, for at Verizon, or you can make a Slack for your friend groups. But talking in between Slacks is not a thing that was really possible. So they announced this feature, and I think immediately everybody was like, hey, wait, this is terrible. Sherlyn, were you following what was going on here? Yeah, I followed it. So what happened was, you know, what's funny is mm -hmm. that before the Slack Connect news was announced, like the day before, it, the Slack Connect showed up on my Slack. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And you, I'm sure you noticed too. And I, I was saw like, something, what? yeah. I clicked through and I was like, oh, you can <laughs> message other people. Mm. Um, so when it got announced, I was like, wait, hasn't this been around? But anyway, that's besides the point. It's just like the inside perspective mm -hmm. of what it's like to live in a journalist's brain. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, there, I didn't really care too much about the potential for abuse of these DM techniques. I don't really know, like, what, um, like, what's the process of inviting someone from outside your organization to chat with you yet? Like, if it's more secure than that. But no. it looks like, right? It looks like it's actually pretty easy. It's it's to, not great. Like, and I, I think, wild. like, yeah, between everything we've seen on social networks over the past few years, right? You got to think about the potential for abuse. And I think that's the main thing. Like Slack announced this thing, which essentially opens the floodgates to people who don't work with you to just slam you in the middle of your work chat to either, you have to accept the invitation, but people saw that the actual invitation itself has text that somebody could easily just yes. keep spamming you, right. even if you want to, if you don't want to talk to them or if you want to block them, uh, people could send you abusive invites. Um, and even somebody you start talking with like you don't have much control over how that whole conversation goes. So mm. yeah, it seems like a bad thing. So almost immediately, right? Yeah. I, I will say that like that, that sort of um, invite mm. format sounds very familiar, right? It sure. sounds a lot like the way LinkedIn goes, the way like a lot of, you know, they're allowed to add a message to be like, Hey, I'd love to connect, but they yeah. could also say a lot of crazy shit in there. Yeah. Um, because LinkedIn is not, LinkedIn is not direct chat. It's not direct chat, yeah. Yeah. So it's like if it's telling like to, it to my email, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'd like to point out that um, Microsoft, speaking of LinkedIn, right? Microsoft mm -hmm. actually had a, a very similar feature announced in March. Mm. Wait, still in March too, right? At Ignite uh, <laughs> this year called Teams Connect. It just didn't get a lot of the same attention, I think, because fewer people use Teams. Not but many people Teams use Connect, Teams, yeah. Yeah, Teams Connect basically also does the same thing, where, but it's similar, it sounds like, where it lets you share channels with people outside of your your organization. So it feels like, or it sounds like the control comes from you mm. sharing people outside. I would rather have that. I would rather yeah. have that. Like the ability to share a room to somebody else, like I'm collaborating with people from another site or another company or something, rather than the direct message. Because my God, I we all get enough direct messages. It's, it's hell. It's got to stop. And also... Uh, the specific uh, ping for Slack, like that note, I feel like is just being embedded in us as dread. Like whenever you hear that, you're like, Ugh, what's, I what's know. happening? Who needs me for I, what now? What's going on here? You know? I have something the, to say. Uh -huh. this, this puts the mess in direct messages. Okay, we're moving on. That's it. Done with the story. <laughs> 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 you ruined it. Um <laughs> messy. Do you need more direct messages in your life, Sherlyn? That's my question. No. Because Slack no. seems so. I have too many direct messages already. Too mm -hmm. many DMs. Too many. Too many. It's just too much. Like the way I deal with messaging <laughs> in the modern world today, like I have a personal email account. I barely check it. You know, I like side eye it. It's like, is there anything important there? And then no, then okay. I keep going with the rest of my life because it is so hard to keep track of email and work email and all everything you're out on Slack or other Slacks with friends or group chats with friends and personal texts. It's too much, too much. So yeah, I, I think it was bad timing for Slack, but also a sign that these companies literally do not think about the basics for the potential for abuse, especially when these companies are so involved in the way we communicate you know so i hope slack totally. takes notice from this yeah before they rule out anything else in the future totally mm -hmm. let's move on uh there was some news from intel this week uh that i wrote up the new ceo pat gelsinger um he has a bold new plan for this company and i think it's pretty interesting uh so he announced the the new idm 2.0 strategy which is basically their new engineering push um, and he says that they're going to be investing $20 billion 
in two Arizona fabrication factories. So those are places where they're actually going to be making chips. And he also announced that the seven nanometer chips, um, starting with the, which one is this, Meteor Lake chip, uh, is actually going to be arriving in 2023. That one was delayed, I think, initially. We expected it this year. Then they told us it could be coming next year. So it's actually two years out from now. But he acknowledged that Intel has had a lot of production issues, especially when it comes to building seven nanometer chips. Uh, right now, all of Intel's desktop hardware and a lot of their laptop chips are 14 nanometers. And that just describes the density of the production process. That is an aging process. That's like tech from 2015 that Intel's relying on. Meanwhile, AMD, their biggest competitor, is out here with seven nanometer CPUs, you know, and seven nanometer GPUs. Uh, I believe Apple's M1 hardware, those are five nanometer chips. So the increased density is a sign of just how sophisticated and complex these companies are when it comes to building their chips. Um, worth pointing out, you can't directly compare them sometimes because of the way, because of the size of the chip die and all sorts of things. Um, I think technically Intel's 10 nanometer chips, which are now in a, a bunch of laptops, uh, are somewhat comparable to AMD 7 nanometer, but that's just me like speaking right now. Uh, I just think like this is worth pointing out because Intel has been kind of stumbling over the last few years, and we've talked about this. Uh, while AMD has come out there with um, really fast new laptop chips, really fast new desktop chips with the Ryzen uh, 4000, 5000 series, um, Intel is just kind of struggling. And then Apple came out with the M1 chips, completely abandoned Intel, you know, a lot of egg on Intel's face there. And Apple's new hardware is some of the fastest, you know, they're some of the fastest machines we've ever seen. So mm -hmm. this whole push is, is Intel saying, okay, we're taking this seriously. We have to do some work to get better now. Do you have any thoughts on this, Sherlyn? Because you cover the PC side of things too. Yeah, I, I, I would love to see Intel mm -hmm. catch up. I think it's kind of sad to be like haha ha, Intel <laughs> like for the longest time now <laughs> and we've seen from like the even last week we were just talking about Intel's whole like marketing strategy seems to be like we're also this or like you know use Justin Long to be like he's yeah, a VP yeah. now haha ha. I would love for Intel to just do good and excel mm -hmm. and that's it like it, it just means good things for the PC market mm -hmm. um, I mean AMD I think this is the result clearly of AMD giving really good competition to Intel mm -hmm. and you can see the benefits trickle out of consumers hopefully soon. I think like Intel just realized like they're lagging behind. They have to invest more. And also it sounds like there's going to be more of a push for U.S. manufacturing too. Uh, we know the Biden administration has talked about like the chip shortage and what it means that we're relying so much on China and other countries to produce the hardware that's at the core of all of our, you know, all of our electronics. Um, Intel's plan is to become more of a fabrication giant rather than a company that is building its own stuff and relying on other companies like TSMC. Um, the plan is that they're going to bring, they're going to do work for partners. So in a couple of years, once these two Arizona plants are out there, they want to be a facility where other people will come and build their own chips. And that's a pretty significant shift for them. And I think it's, it's a shift that says we, we know what our bread and butter business is. You know, we're really going to focus on that. Um, they talked about having eventually some plants in Europe as well. So they kind of want a global scale to this. Uh, Intel will probably not be able to compete too much in Asia because all the major chip companies are there now. Uh, yeah. The funny thing is that despite all this, it's like Intel saying like, hey, we're strong now. We'll take care of ourselves. At the same time, they announced like, oh, we need a lot of help to build these seven nanometer chips over the next few years. So actually over the next few years, they're also going to be working together with the uh, TSMC to build some of these seven nanometer chips. They're going to be working with partners while at the same time building up their own capabilities. So, hey, maybe this means a better, stronger Intel. Um, I'll tell you guys, like, after listening to Gelsinger talk, uh, his voice is very, like, radio hosty. Like, he's a very smooth operator. But I was talking with Aaron Soporis. Yeah, he's very smooth. Like, he sounds like he's just out there uh, on a game show or something. But talking to Aaron Saporis, like it does sound like this guy, he is an actual engineer. You know, he's somebody who helped design the 486, and I believe the Pentium uh, back in the day. So he has like a, a strong like sense of what Intel is and what they can actually grow to be. Uh, Aaron wrote up this piece called A Strong Intel is What the Tech Industry Needs Right Now. So check that out, Engadget. Mm -hmm. It's a very lengthy, deep piece that goes into um, 
kind of what this means. You know, what is, what is the deeper plan here? How does this set up Intel versus AMD versus Apple versus TSMC and Samsung and every, everybody over the next few years? So this is big news. It's, it may sound like kind of overly technical right now, but just um, think of it broadly. Intel is investing a lot in building its own chips and building chips for other people. And maybe maybe this is them getting a handle on their destiny for once, because it feels like they've just been racing to catch up to everybody over the past few years, right? Yes. And before you go on, uh -huh. I, I just wanted to shout out. Oh, shout out. <laughs> shout out. It's term out of my vocabulary. But <laughs> anyway, um, this week too, just today, uh, mm -hmm. as we're recording this, uh, Qualcomm just un announced the mm, Snapdragon G chipset, which mm -hmm. is the first five nanometer design process chip in the 700 series portfolio, which means that the potential benefits of that density in transistors uh, could be coming to the slightly cheaper flagship sure. level, uh, which is nice. Nice to see mm -hmm. Qualcomm do that. And uh, we were discussing this in our team Slack the other mm -hmm. day, like what this news means, right? And knowing that the Apple iPhone 12 mini uses the A14, which is mm -hmm. we believe i'm pretty sure it's a five nanometer chip as yep. well uh this gives android phones the the potential to catch up and close the gap between like apple's like super high-end chips in its mid-rangey yeah. phone we'll if you see. can call the 12 mini that <laughs> no the 12 mini is still high-end it's just smaller that's all like every all the components are still high-end it's a little bit cheaper than the, the yeah. typical 12 but you know um mm -hmm. So, so that's another bit of an update from the land of chip news, even if mm -hmm. it's a bit more than Intel. <laughs> the chip wars are going to be really interesting over the next few years because we're also, we talked about the GPU wars, right? That's NVIDIA versus AMD. Uh, Intel is trying to get into there too with their new X GPUs. And if you buy a new Intel laptop and it has like, the uh, the Intel Evo sticker on it. I just bought my wife the XPS 13 2 in 1. That means it has XE graphics. It means it like can do a lot of different things um, and has good battery life and all sorts of stuff. So we can have thin and light laptops now that play The Sims and Overwatch and some basic 3D games. I think it's pretty good progress. It's just uh, Apple's still killing everybody. You're talking about the gap between Android and Apple, right? And that's tough. You yeah. look at benchmarks and it's like Qualcomm's fastest chips are often significantly slower than Apple's chips from several years ago. You know, there is a huge I, performance gap there. Yeah, I'd love to see how the 888 benchmarked against the A14 mostly. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done that just because I didn't test an 888 phone yet. <laughs> I, I, perhaps the S21 uh, Ultra. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, but the 888 might be the closest, I think, to an A14 uh, with its slightly different architecture, but... Mm. Yeah, it's it's not great. Like I think, as the M1 chips were coming out, people were benching those A14s and everything just to get a sense of like what Apple's mobile hardware would be, and everybody was shocked at how fast Apple stuff was. We kind of knew there was a huge performance gap, and Apple also has the benefit of designing chips that are specifically tuned for its software and for the mm -hmm. hardware they're putting into everything. Whereas everybody else is like, I'm gonna take this off the shelf. Qualcomm component, and I hope yep. it works together with this other piece of software. Like they're playing Legos while Apple's building like a very custom tuned, you know, uh, speed machine. One block of wood, whereas exactly like, Qualcomm is like stick, 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 and then it's a whole different thing. <laughs> it's a whole different thing. So yeah, we're gonna be following all this. Um, Intel, I think, is known for. I think straight up lying to us is the best way to say it. Like I've covered Intel for pretty much ten years now, and. They make a lot of announcements, but they also miss a lot of deadlines. And that's something people really like people called in and asked uh, the CEO, right? Is like, if we, if you cannot even deliver your own stuff on time, why would anybody partner with you to build something on a deadline? And he was like, they're starting, they are starting a whole new side of the business uh, in Intel foundry services, I believe. Um, so that's going to be a completely separate run business, uh, not tied to Intel's roadmap or anything else. So mm. I'm hoping like they figure out how to manage this and having more chip production in the U S and, you know, in Europe too, is going to, is going to be super helpful, especially right now. We don't have enough chips for cars. We don't have enough chips for, you know, um, a lot of systems and electrical electronic components that we're dealing with. So this could be a stop, uh, this could be a fix for that. Mm -hmm. Let's move on something real quick. Uh, we saw some news. All of a sudden, Microsoft stopped using the Xbox Live branding 
uh, on the Xbox One and you know online and uh, references to Xbox Live, which is their subscription service that you you know you'd pay for to play games online. That's what Xbox Live launched as with the original Xbox, I believe, and certainly beefed itself up with the Xbox 360. Um, now they're, they're just calling it the Xbox Network. So, huh. That's interesting to me. Yeah. Network. Huh, what's that? Is this similar to the PlayStation Network, like a PSN? Well, I mean, the name, sure. But I, the thing is, PSN mainly exists because Xbox Live existed, right? Like, Microsoft was the first company to say, hey, we need a unified way of bringing online gaming to consoles. It was kind of a mess before that. Um, I remember the first time, actually, it was the Sega Dreamcast was my first system that ever went online. And that thing had a, I think it launched with the 33K modem, but I, I got a 56K modem. I was dialing up to phone numbers to play Fantasy Star Online. You know, that was my introduction to uh, multiplayer gaming uh, because my PC at the time was not good enough for anything. So Xbox Live was kind of the successor to all of that and it influenced how Nintendo and Sony and everybody kind of took this market. What we're seeing now is that the Xbox network, uh, they're changing things up because they're not going to be charging anymore for free to play games like Fortnite. Uh, before you actually had to pay that monthly subscription service to play a game like Fortnite which is completely free. And that was a difference compared to every other platform out there. So Microsoft raced to catch up in that respect. And uh, I don't, this probably doesn't mean much moving forward, uh, except the idea that uh, maybe eventually they'll stop selling Xbox Live as its own thing. And maybe they'll move into Game Pass, uh, which is their game subscription service. Uh, and Game Pass Ultimate is the one that includes Xbox Live. Uh, mm. Maybe we will see them pushing more towards that to get people online. Um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the Sherlin? I know. Have you done much all, uh, online gaming yet on consoles? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still don't have a new next gen console. So mm -hmm. no. And the whole like Xbox Game Pass thing was one of the the lures, and the Xbox Live branding being removed. <laughs> just, does this mean there's no more? Doesn't like, mean anything. Yeah, I, it just sounded like it's not going to affect my decision too much or my experience with a new con console too much so now and you it's have your switch you're very good with that exactly. for a while well mm -hmm. i'm playing a lot more with the oculus quest 2 but Ooh. uh yeah that's that's a whole that's another conversation that's a whole other thing um the one plus event happened we kind of hinted at that last week you're calling it kind of cringe i'm wondering what kind of what kind of cringe is it you know what was so uh, rough with this event I know, I know. You know how like last uh, last time we were talking about Samsung's event being like squat lit fam yeet. <laughs> this was the this was light on that. Let's let's just say they never used millennialisms or Gen Z terms, but it was cringing. Like there was a moment where one of the presenters was talking about the OnePlus Nine uh, after another presenter had already explained how awesome the OnePlus Nine Pro was. They thought. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the guy explaining the OnePlus 9 was saying that, oh, of course, you know, we have great cameras, too. Look how great this HDR is, blah, blah. <laughs> and then he somehow ends up talking to a clone of himself uh, and <laughs> each other why the camera is great. And then they try to high five. But then the other he's like, nope, denied or something. And at some point he goes and then they show sample pictures of like a woman taken with the um, OnePlus 9. And they go, yeah, you know what's the most awesome about this? Not the camera, it's the model. And I was like, oh, uh, that's very good. Is this their first like big event that they're trying to talk to an international audience? Because I remember a lot of their launches have mainly been China-focused and Asia-focused, right? Well, OnePlus is a, has always sort of targeted <laughs> more international regions than counterparts like, I think, Xiaomi or Oppo. Sure, or sure um you know they've they've always done better i think than those brands overseas so they have a pretty like significant presence i want to say in europe the uk and they're mm -hmm. one of the few here in the u.s that's doing fairly well it's not their first big event they've had events in new york in the past right, uh, right. brooklyn navy yard or something uh we just never really paid as much attention <laughs> a, like we didn't mm -hmm. have that 
time to go and cover an event live in person with everything else that usually goes on this time of year. Um, so this time we w- were able to pay more attention to it because everyone's at home and mm-hmm. nine and nine pro are like s- the result of years and years of refining a, a formula that one plus is known. And also the Hasselblad or Hasselblad partnership is also mm-hmm. like pretty new. So we just wanted to like, give it give it the recognition it deserved but uh okay. that to your point though, of oneplus kind of um generally being more asia and china based mm-hmm. it showed in the presentation and not in like in the way where like you know how a lot of t- keynotes by like google apple microsoft mm-hmm. they all try to like bring out more diverse people uh-huh. To- uh-huh. So, yeah no oneplus was like two white men and one age and, and then and a clone like two white oh, clones white clone. yeah, yeah and also a white clone so like i uh, i get it like i just uh-huh. was the whole time was like there were there were a lot of asian people mm-hmm. and and white people represented but it felt like not a lot of other people were represented for sure, for sure. which bugged me a little bit yeah looking at clips it reminds me of men like we used to go to computex r.i.p in oh. taipei and oh. uh it's usually asus's big media events uh where they kind of blow everything out they're the big you know they're the ones swinging all their money around because they're local to taiwan but (laughs) some of the first ones we covered was just like is this the hunger games it's just (laughs) like it is like very uh very pop you know uh pompous looking people in Mm -hmm. very fancy outfits but it's either uh, very, very light-skinned Asian people or white people who I think just find a great amount of success by being very white in Asia, apparently. Yeah. They're, they're definitely- it looked like the Hunger Games. It was amazing. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> plus lots of booth babes in, in Computex. Still. Lots of booth babes. Scantily yep. clad women whose entire job is to look good, I think, and, and mm-hmm. know a little bit about product. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's not great but that i mean to be fair one plus didn't have that which is <laughs> they didn't have that a low bar but good news they didn't have uh-huh. that but uh the, the event was cringe the phone itself is like kind of interesting although the starting price wasn't that uh great for diehard one plus fans you're used to it being like a sub 500 or even a 500 dollars mm-hmm. phone um the interesting i think uh unveil was the one plus watch we knew mm-hmm. it was coming, but we found out a bit more about it. Specifically, the most interesting thing to me is the warp charge technology the company built into the OnePlus watch, which uh-huh. promises to get you a full day of juice in just five minutes of charging and like a whole week in 20 minutes of charging, which for uh-huh. smartwatches today is really, really fast. So mm-hmm. it's something to look out for and pay attention to. And Watching... I'm- their promo video for this by the way like that's playing as we're talking about this there is one thing with the one plus watch where it was just like somebody running away from the cops or somebody <laughs> running away from security is that how you're promoting your your smartwatch hardware is like it'll it's so good like it'll survive you uh parkouring down <laughs> some stairs as you watch for parkour. after you steal something yeah right right i and it's huge it's a it only comes in a 46 millimeter case that's uh, big yeah yeah so i i'm not sure the price also is very interesting it's uh 159 us dollars that's pretty good yeah available here in the u.s and uh it'll last for up to two weeks on light <laughs> use so so you know it's like fitbit garmin territory in terms mm-hmm. of battery life and price wise it's like fitbit tracker territory so Mm-hmm. It's impressive, the price and the battery life and the charge. Does it have uh, an always on screen? That's not clear yet. Exactly. Okay. So so that's one of the questions uh, Nate asked me right after the event. And I was like, oh, yeah, I it's not in the spec sheet at all. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure they, they're using a proprietary OS. Um, so it's not clear. <laughs> if, yeah, it's not Wear OS. So it mm-hmm. uh, doesn't have that feature built in. How do we but, feel about Android watches at this point? Like I, We're waiting I, for them to become Fitbit watches is... Uh, <laughs> Sure, sir. Um, so, but what about the Fitbit watch right now? Like if I needed something right now and I'm on Android and I don't want, you know, I can't use an Apple watch. Is the Fitbit stuff the best choice? Is it the Garmin stuff? Or does it depend on like the type of, like, does it depend if I want to be active and want to hike yeah. or if I just want to walk around and have like a little screen on my wrist for convenience yeah. sake? Like what, it, what what are the recommendations right now? The recommendation till today is still a Galaxy watch. Samsung's uh-huh. Galaxy watch active is really good. Even the, 
uh, if, if you're more focused on fitness and like you're mm-hmm. working out, if you want a more multi-purpose watch, the Samsung Galaxy watch is also the, li- the line to go for. If you're interested in collecting as much info about your body as possible, the Fitbit Sense is the, you know, it's pretty powerful. Uh, it's got more sensors than any other fitness watch on the market. Uh, it does like it, it temp- skin temperature and it uses that to monitor all kinds of things like whether you have a fever onset or if you know your period is starting for example um and then if you're a runner people generally recommend the garmin series like the forerunner is a good series or mm-hmm. if you're not that you know into running you could try a more multi-purpose garmin like a, a vivo smart vivo move for sure for sure uh, there's are a they, lot out there for android people. Out there, but it seems like specialized right not where it's like if I'm an Apple user, right? And it's like, I, I kind of want something fun for my wrist. Um, you mm-hmm. could just get an Apple Watch and the Apple Watch will be fine for you as a casual user. And also pretty like pretty decent for you if you're an active uh, person who wants to exercise too, because that also ties into Apple Fitness Plus and everything. Mm-hmm. You always have the choice of getting a Garmin watch or Fitbit or whatever, but yes, it seems exactly. like Apple Watch is a nice default for everybody on iOS at least. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Apple Watch is the best for anyone using an iPhone. There's no, there's no two ways about it. It mm-hmm. has the best like messaging, uh, syncing, and connectivity through your phone. It's, I've been using the Apple Watch SE for a while now, and honestly, it's pretty good. It's pretty, pretty, it's good. pretty, pretty good. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's just move straight on to the next segment. Uh, ben, yeah. I know, I know, you want to have some time for Q and A. At our current rate, we're gonna have a lot of time, so I don't want like twenty yeah, minutes. I think we can, we yeah. can clear it. Conclusion okay, and- sure. I, I am I am watching the clock and filling for time right now <laughs> as we're doing this because we have two more sections before Q&A. Okay. <clears throat> Let's move on to her. So thank long. you all for joining us. Normally, we would stop and do a Q&A right now. But let's wait. We're going to do a couple more segments. We'll wrap like the end of the show. Then we'll do like probably like a media 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Yeah. So the, a reminder on this, if you came for talking about tech policy and stuff, that's going to be at 11, uh, maybe, you know, like 10.55 or 11 Eastern time, because uh, mm-hmm. we've got someone on the West Coast and asking them to get up uh, that early, like three hours it's, earlier. Just it's for not us worth it. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's uh kind of brutal so we try to be as nice to anyone on the west coast and mountain time as possible so uh, yeah, sure. our our social media editor is going to be coming in soon but first we're going to be talking about uh working on stuff some pop culture stuff mm-hmm. we're going to be doing a false ending we're going to be recording the ending so but stick, stick around. around because yeah. after the ending we're going to be doing some q a and so on mm-hmm. and yeah so on and so on so, so on yeah, and let's so on. get to work on <clears throat> working right. on working on so let's move on to what we've been. <clears throat> let's move on to what we've been working on. Um, I am writing up something on Zack Snyder's Justice League cut, which is just breaking my brain. I'll talk more about this on the pop culture side, but you know, I'm talking about the impact of what this means for fans to basically clamor for this thing to exist, and for Snyder and the cast to really support it too, and for HBO to basically will it into existence because. Um, they're desperate and they need exclusive content for HBO Max. So uh, I'm talking about the impact of that, what that means for the future of creation. Like can fans just sit there and basically whine and create internet, uh, you know, petitions for everything and reshape the way content is made in the future. We're kind of seeing evidence of that right now, especially with this cut. So keep an eye out for my piece about that. Earlier this week, I wrote up my experience with South by Southwest VR. I talked a bit about this last week, but I spent more time with it. Um, it, they were using this thing called VR chat to basically recreate um, all of Austin. And it was like, it's really, really interesting, really detailed. They had a cool like neon Blade Runner design for it too. But I also just going through is like, man, this is, this is a desert. There is no, there's no humanity in here. It's a couple other people in VR headsets. Um, you could pull up like a virtual camera and either take photos, which I was doing or do like virtual selfies. So it did feel like the worst part of South by where it's just people in every like iconic spot holding their phones up to themselves and trying to be cute for Instagram um, rather than actually talking to each other or anything. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a lonely desolate experience and it just made me feel as we're, we were moved on from the first year anniversary of the pandemic. It did make me feel a little like, man, I cannot wait until we can go back in person and do these events. Uh, 
South by was a thing where we would sometimes wait in line. We waited over two hours to see the premiere of Jordan Peele's Us, and we didn't get in. We waited, we waited in line. We were doing work. We were just like working on the sidewalk. We got up to the theater right when, as like as they closed the the rope, I guess, because the theater got too full. Um, and just had to walk away. But at the same time, that was super frustrating and disappointing. But I also had fun like hanging out with everybody at Engadget. And we all just sat there and worked and like we're doing this thing. And it was disappointing, but it was disappointing as a collective experience. Yes. And I do miss all those little those little things, even the disappointments of a live event. So maybe I'm just in my feelings. I don't know. Um, but I'm sure we all want to get outside and do things, right? Yeah, I, I was so... <laughs> Uh, I've been watching a lot of Kitchen Nightmares, and then I started <laughs> researching Gordon Ramsay's restaurants, and one of them is the uh-huh. Gordon Ramsay plane food uh, in London's Heathrow Airport Terminal Five. What? And I'm looking at the menu. It's the whole the whole concept is that like he makes these like airplane friendly boxes. Of it sounds incredibly food. sad, but okay, go on, go on. It, it sounds amazing to me. I'm like, I can't wait to like go buy one of these boxes. I'll take it on the plane and just like stuff my face in a cramped little seat and just like. That's true. You that know. is the ritual. The ritual of going on the flight is if you're if you're like a, a major flyer, right? You would know like I got to get some food, and I'm not going to just live with the plain food. I'm going to like sneak yeah. something on. Yeah. Yeah. Water, <laughs> my water, my flight snacks and candy, yeah. uh, my switch, and Your whatever switch. delicious little meal I can get myself. So <laughs> next time I'm in Heathrow, I don't know how many years from now, I am going to get myself a box from Gordon Ramsay's plain food. It sounds listen. So we all good. have goals. We need goals. <laughs> Small goals, like my goal, like honestly, I do. I miss flying. I miss all the frustrations of flying and everything too. But the thing of just like saying, I am just going to sit in the seat, and three yep. hours later, I'm going to be in a completely different place. Like I kind of yep. really got used to that being a thing. I yep. know flying is bad for the environment. We're even once things get better, we're going to probably have to do a lot less flying. Um, but I do miss that sense of travel and the sense of like sure. going to new places. Um, kind of related yeah. to all this, actually. Another thing I'm working on, which I'll just bring up here. I'm working on getting vaccinated for COVID and I hope you are too. I was able to um, secure one here um, in Georgia because of medical conditions. Um, it is, it is like a mess how our distribution is going. Um, I basically had to, I was lucky enough where I was able to sign up with my doctor and they sent me an alert saying, Hey, you can actually sign up right now. I went to this mass vaccination site um, at an old abandoned mall outside of Atlanta and let me tell you guys, it is one of the most hopeful things I've seen over the last year. Okay, the idea that after all this, after all the mess, after a year of you know a government literally doing nothing to help us, uh, and then a government insurrection, and then a lot of other things happening, it felt really hopeful to go into a place and just see like competence and people being like, okay, stand here, you're gonna get, you're gonna, you're gonna be saved. You're gonna take this ticket, take this line fill out this form, go this way. We got you. We got you. We have competence. We know what we're doing. It feels really great to be somewhere where people know what they're doing. And also everybody was just there celebrating the fact that, yeah, we're, we're getting through this. It's We have these miraculous vaccines. We could not have seen them actually even being a thing last summer, right? Like these things came so quickly. They were approved really quickly. It is a miracle in many, in many senses. And the fact that we have these available, I hope more people try to take it because I, I feel I felt like it was an obvious thing and maybe for a lot of our audience and for you Sherlyn and all of us in Gadget but talking to people around my neighborhood and maybe it's just because I live in Georgia there are people who you know I, I think I politically align with and I, I think are nice people but they have skepticism they're worried about the vaccine they don't think they need it they you know there are all these excuses I hear um, what we do know is that for the public good for public health if you can get vaccinated please do. Please do. Because it's the only way we're going to fight this. I don't know if you have any further thoughts on this, Sherlyn, or your journey to get vaccinated. I I don't have any like medical conditions. I do have a bunch of allergies that, that might make it a little bit difficult for me. Um, mm. but I'm going to just talk to the doctor whenever I get there and be like, hey, and they're, it- they're opening it up like even in Georgia, which is has been one of the most backward states when it's come to pandemic policy and whatever. As of today, Every adult can get it. And given um, President Biden's like push to basically have every adult vaccinated in time for July 4th cookout, uh, very symbolic of them. uh, That means over the next few weeks, certainly by next month, most adults in America will be able to get it. The, The question is, how do you get it? 
It's okay. really annoying. It's really difficult. One thing I will tell everybody, if you, um, if you live in the Southeast or anywhere where there's a Publix grocery store where they're doing shots, um, I was able to get like one for my wife, but you have to wake up at 7 a.m. Eastern on Thursday mornings, refresh that website and hope you can lock something in. So yeah, our distribution strategy stinks. Hopefully it'll get better, but good luck everybody. It is worth the effort to try and do this. It's the only way we can fight back. What have you been working on, Charlotte? Yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, I have been, uh, let's peel this thing back a little bit, how, how my, uh -huh. how I work, my process, my brain, whatever our, our process is, I, uh, haven't been publishing a lot of like big reviews or whatever lately. And it causes me to feel a little bit unproductive at times. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done a lot of like interviews and a lot of the researching work and I'm doing a lot of secret stuff that I can't talk about, but, <laughs> um, the, the 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 issue is sometimes we run into writer's block sometimes sure, we, sure. like oh how do i say this in a fun way and it's, it's also been a year of us being super productive when the world is falling apart like it's okay it's okay yeah. to like pick that minute yeah. and be like uh this is hard it's just, it's just demoralizing to yeah. feel like oh i'm up against this wall and but but i i managed yeah. to find a little bit of inspiration so hopefully this will come through soon and next week you should hopefully see a bunch more things from me but right now it's like i feel like I'm crashing into a wall mm -hmm. where like either mm -hmm. the people I need to get back to me aren't getting back to me or I just don't have the motivation to write something uh, that I find is a good read for you guys or for anyone really. So, uh -huh. um, you know, I'd say stay tuned next week. This week I did cover one plus and, and, you know, I have some other news posts I think that went up and I'm working on some stuff that I still can't talk about. <laughs> it'll be fun to talk next week. Let's just say it, let's just say it'll be fun to talk next week. It'll be fun. Um, I think Sherlyn, you have overachiever disease like I do, which uh, has haunted me throughout my childhood and certainly into adulthood. Um, yep. I've, uh, it has also taken me a lot to get that under check because the yep. world is falling apart. It's okay if you need to take a break. Exactly. Please take some vacation time. I hope you can find some time to relax at some point, Sherlyn. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, let's move on to our pop culture picks. Uh, what, what have you been watching or playing or whatever? Yeah. So <laughs> a few things. <laughs> One, uh -huh. you were talking about the Justice League Snyder cut, 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 cut. And, uh, I want to hear your take on the black and white version at some point that it's ruined. Yeah. But anyway, I was supposed to watch it last weekend. Didn't get around to it because, uh, started dinner too late, whatever. And then there was <laughs> too late to whatever. Anyway, so watched instead watched Raya and the last dragon. Uh, Fun. I had to talk to you about that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it's, um, it's fine. It's an okay, like it, it's, you know, it's the action not, is surprisingly good. You know, as a Disney thing, it's fun. The yeah. Art was really nice. Mm -hmm. The story was fine. Like very hackneyed almost. I feel. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, but, but uh, we do the, the core of that movie is that we need to learn to trust each other. And I do think yeah. moving on from this pandemic, I can't trust anybody. I don't know. Hey, have you been vaccinated? Is that why you don't have a mask? Why are you so close? Like, I, I don't know if I can trust you to keep my well being right. or the social good. So I, it's a good message in that respect. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with that. I just want to say that, like, my as uh, the problem is that I'm an adult watching this show. And so a lot of the voice <laughs> voices were uh -huh. very obvious to me yeah and it had this like effect of uh making their characters look like them even almost well daniel uh, day kim's character looks like him for sure. like he him. has his like oh, chiseled human, yeah, yeah. Oh, Fina's human character looks a lot like her too uh -huh. uh, benedict wong i believe didn't look a lot like his character here's the thing mm -hmm. though it's it's when it's so clear to me in my head who these uh -huh. actors are they're so uh -huh. clearly not southeast asian though that uh -huh really made a disconnect for me in that movie yeah. but anyway that's 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 my take on ryan the last dragon as a southeast asian person mm -hmm. um my real uh uh recommendation is not pop culture at all because for pop culture all i've been doing is binge watch kitchen nightmares so <laughs> <laughs> my real recommendation for everyone is if you don't already use a session manager you should Mm. Especially if you're someone like me who has a crap ton of Chrome tabs or, or sure. Firefox tabs open, Session Buddy is one of the best available. I don't want to go on too long about them because then it starts sounding like an ad. But I tried one tab before and one tab just isn't the same because it doesn't like – I don't think it's as automatically 
you know, saved as Session Buddy does. Session Buddy saves your last three sessions by default. And it's, the interface is cleaner. OneNote just looks like it was written in 1997 and then nobody decided to update the UI. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, not OneNote, OneTab. So one tab, yeah. all of that. But yeah, hey, I didn't know if you if you were doing the thing I, I used to do, which is go to bookmarks and bookmark all open tabs and then save the date that you had all those tabs open. What year is this? What are you doing? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what I've been doing up until like this week. And wow. my cousin told me about Session Buddy. So here you go. free A freebie tip from my cousin. A freebie tip from 20, 2005 <laughs> or whenever we started having tab organization. <laughs> Just in case you didn't already know, you're an idiot like me. <laughs> it's okay, we can all be idiots. Uh, you know, session buddy, session managers, look into it. All right. Uh, is that it for you, Sherlyn? Yeah, that's all my picks. Not pop culture, but that's okay. <laughs> I want to quickly just shout out a couple of things because I want to give us some time yes. for Q&A in our live chat. But I saw the first episode for Made for Love, which is Ooh. a new HBO series. Uh, I saw the that, three episodes. Yeah, you saw a bunch. Um, they, yeah. they had the first episode at South by 2. This is a series that is very tech centric, right? It is about mm -hmm. a woman who is trying to escape from her tech billionaire husband, mm -hmm. who a guy, basically like the head of Google or something, who has developed uh, this chip that mm -hmm. can unite a couple's brains, I mm -hmm. guess, into one, like like to let them basically not have any secrets between them, see everything that each other is saying. And um, the the thing of the show is that Kristen Milioti is trying to escape and she has this chip in her. And yeah. this kind of abusive guy is just following her all the way. It's a comedy. It's kind of a comedy, but also like it is, it's an adult show. Like there's a lot of dark humor it's in HBO there. HBO Max, yeah. like, let's put it out there. It's, it's HBO Max. <laughs> like uh, there there is like one of the first scenes is like how yep. he has created an, an orgasm meter. And um, the whole thing is that... Uh, she constantly gets reminders to rate her orgasm, which mm -hmm. I feel like we're not that far from that future. Like, I don't know how many times you have to, uh, you open an app on your phones, like, please, for the love of God, review me <laughs> on iTunes. Like, are you, are you enjoying this experience? So it is a bit Black Mirror. It's a bit, um, I don't know, devs in a way too. What did you think of the first few episodes you yeah. saw, Sherlyn? So to me, it was very devs meets... Um... Darn, what was it? I told you in our production meeting. It was very mm. dev. It's yes, Black Mirror, but also oh, there's one other show that I really I forget really which of. one. Yeah. Silicon Valley yeah. kind of comes to mind here too. Yeah. Maybe not not upload, but maybe upload. Anyhow, um uh -huh. there's other actors in this that like um Ray Romano's in it. I love Ray hey, put Ray Romano in a show. I'm gonna watch yeah. it. That's really I how we are right it. now. Yeah, it, and his scene, uh, Dev, you haven't seen the later episodes, I'm not gonna spoil no. it, but it, the, one of them is very shocking. Uh <laughs> And uh, every time he appears, I think he he featured more heavily in episode two or episode three, both of those. Mm -hmm. Every time I see him, I'm like, that's Ray Romano. Like, I have that's to Ray Romano. Myself. That's Ray Romano. Like, oh, oh, okay, okay. Anyhow, um, yeah, this show is is uh more adult, and it's kind of hard to watch because as a woman, I think it made it very hard to watch. Does, but, did this remind you of the nest bedside thing that we talked about last week, Sherlyn, which I thought you know, was kind of terrifying? Yeah, there's there's little props in the first episode that remind are very reminiscent of that, and uh -huh. then they live in this thing called the hub, which is very like high tech and futuristic. But then the rest well, it, of the world it's is a desert compound with a fake sun, so her yeah. and she's literally living in a box, yeah. and yeah. she has to escape the box. Yeah, I, I remember the show that reminded me off. Now it's the circle. It's yes, basically the, the premise of the circle, the movie, mm -hmm. but executed I think better as a TV show. Maybe um, interesting for sure. Not not like. Uh, Definitely not the same type of comedy that let Ted Lasso is. I almost said let Tesso. Ted Lasso. Uh, <laughs> it's not the same feel good vibe. It's more like I. Nothing I, feel good about this, no. Nothing feel good. But I have so many questions. It's almost like a mystery. It's like, yeah. But, you yeah. know, intriguing for sure. Intriguing. It's premiering on HBO Max on April 1st. We will be looking more into the show. Uh, quickly want to shout out a movie I just saw over the weekend called Happily by Ben David Grabinski, who is a, you know, he's a, he's a writer. He's pretty big on Twitter, if you if you follow media people. Um, it was Drama Kill. So this is a movie I really enjoyed. It is about a couple that is way too happy after like 15 years. Like they're still really into each other. Um, you know, they, they love each other in a way that seems unnatural. And everyone around them is like, guys, you are, you are aliens. You know, what is wrong with you? Um, that premise kind of leads into this weird like, almost sci-fi conspiracy thing. Um, I'd say 
it's worth watching. I think you would enjoy it, Sherlin. Also, it has a cast that I absolutely love. Carrie Bechet from Halting Catch Fire. Um, I will watch her in anything. But yeah, Joel McHale, Natalie Zia, Paul Shear, who I love very much. He joined us on the Slash Film cast a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Stephen Root. Always great to see Stephen Root um, in anything. Natalie Morales. Uh, watch this movie, folks. It is a ton of fun. It is not what you expect. If you like like weird thrillers that are funny and super dark at times, uh, but also kind of goes places like i think it's a lot of fun it's happily you can rent it or buy it on demand now okay it sounds like the opposite of this other movie that i watched that i recommend you don't do not uh-huh. watch deadly illusions i have not heard of that but i will take your word for it it is dermo mulroney <laughs> yeah. i'll take Sorry. your word for it and also oh. yeah i watched the justice league snyder cut and uh hey go listen to my review at the slash film cast about that because i have complicated feelings about this thing it's four hours long of course it's a deeper and more like you can cover more than the Joss Whedon cut of the movie did in two hours. But also there, I think there ultimately there is a good three hour movie in this four hour, you know, <laughs> over long slog fest. So I was not a huge fan. Um, my co-host liked it more. I'd love to know what you think, Sherlyn, when you do finally get to see it. I can't wait to watch it really. Cool. And well, I think we can take us, uh, take us out. Sherlyn. Okay. Ben, I'll do the outro. Yeah. You can take us out on a date or with a sniper rifle. Depends on what you want. <laughs> take you out to the ball game. All right. Um, and that's it for the episode this week, everyone. Thank you, as always, for listening. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find Davindra online at at Davindra on Twitter and podcasting about movies and TV at the slash filmcast at slash film.com. If you want to tell me the names of Southeast Asian actors that could have been voice actors for people <laughs> who the last dragon, uh-huh. hit me up. I'm at Sherlyn Lowe on Twitter. Email us your thoughts and feedback at podcast at Engadget.com. Please leave us a review on iTunes because that'll really help us find people and people find us. And subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. Woo! All right. Time okay. For- so, yeah. So, time, time for Q and A. I think I see one person in the chat saying, um, "Like, take one out on a date or with the, or with a sniper rifle." That was dark. I, that was also not original. I think I uh, cribbed that from British TV. Um, I just uh-huh. think that it's uh, funny and clever. Yeah, you got to watch where your references are coming from because British references can get can go real yeah. quick. It, it, yeah, it can get they can go really really dark. Um, <laughs> so uh, speaking of British stuff, uh, so we've got a couple of um, UK natives in the chat. Hmm. Uh, I think Mark Dell is from the UK. Daniel Cockin is also from the UK. So while you were talking about Intel and chips, they were talking about fish and chips. <laughs> I do like fish and chips. So yeah, uh, yeah we were batting around ideas. Uh, I was saying that I want to travel once this global pandemonium is over, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I haven't been to the UK before, so it would be nice to go to uh, the UK, go to a real chipper, maybe spend a little bit of time in Scotland because I've heard so, so many good things about Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you know, I was getting um, uh, like suggestions on where to go in the uk from people who lived in the uk that was pretty cool but also not tech centric so let's get to tech centric uh when we were talking about the phones i mean there were there were a lot of people there was actually one person Ooh, i don't know if i can go back and find their name if i find their name i'll uh, shout it out one person said that the um (laughs) you could clearly see where they um what they thought about uh, mobile stuff. They said that a lot of tech reviewers end up talking about hardware just because when it comes to software, Apple beats everything. That's very, that that is to the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Uh, What do you, what do you think, Miss Android? (laughs) It's hard to say. I think there are some things that Apple does better, but Android tends to see a lot more new features first. And then Apple has security down and privacy down. So it's kind of like, not apples and oranges, which by the way, is a cringe joke that uh, OnePlus made at its event. But, uh, you know, I can't, I can't say either way if there's one definitively better software or OS than, than another. All good. Hello, Carissa. Carissa is joining us now. Hello, hello. 
Hello, hello. Are you using uh, a mic or anything, Krista? Uh, I have AirPods. You have AirPods? Okay, that's going to work. Um, and are you able to do the local recording? Or Ben can just uh, also do it from his I background. I have backup. Audacity running right now, so fantastic. Cool. Hopefully so that's I think, working. <laughs> I think it might actually, so if you have your AirPods connected to your computer, it might actually be better to just record like a voice memo. So mm. if you could like get your phone and just like okay. set your phone in front of you, recording a voice memo locally, sure. then you that would can be great. just yeah. send that to me. Okay. Chris sure. is going to join us to talk about tech policy and Yay. all this fun stuff. Um, heads up for the live stream viewers who were going to try to end this stream by 11.30 a.m. because we're covering the congressional hearing at noon. Carissa is on that, and here on the YouTube channel, you'll be able to watch it as well. So Ooh. come back for that, but mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of time left, I think no, is what I was no. trying to say. Uh, I want to say hello to, I think, Dance Brickmanis, who says it's their first time tuning into this live Yay. stream. So hey, welcome. It's nice around here. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Mark Dell says, uh, Mark Dell and Daniel Cocaine have joined the uh, unofficial <laughs> Discord <laughs> that they've set up for this community, and uh, they're asking no each responsibility other about... for whatever happens on that Discord. Yes, yes. They're, they're talking about cat pictures and dog pictures. Daniel Cocaine has said that they've made it uh, very clear it's unofficial, hopefully. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's uh, I'm definitely very, very itching to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any other questions, Ben, as we prepare? We've got a couple um, minutes. Uh, Mark was talking about the uh, Asus ROG. Uh, is it Flock? Phone 5? Oh. Or is it? Yeah, Something yeah. Else. Well, okay. I mean, the way he spelled it was Flocks, but the, the, the ROG uh, X13. Mm. The Flow? Oh, that is the Flow. Oh, yeah, is it Flow? Flow okay. X13. Yeah, then it was just misspelled. I uh, so we did write up a preview for that. That is the like ultra portable that they created that has like an external GPU uh, that you can just plug in really quickly. We haven't reviewed it yet. I can't get that hardware. I'm asking Aces repeatedly. So hopefully we'll get that to take a look at. Um, I will say I'm I'm wary of anything that relies on an external GPU just because we've seen pretty like like laptops like the Aces G14 and. Um, a lot of things from pretty much every company now. If you have a built-in video card that's pretty decent, it actually doesn't cost that much. You can get great performance. The whole trouble with the external GPU, um, you add a lot of expense to that just to have that privilege. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how that works out. Uh, some people like the idea of having like a three-pound laptop that you could plug in at home and then have the full power of a desktop GPU. I don't know. I feel like gaming laptops need to be at least 15 inches for me to really feel immersed in them. Yeah. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm um, imagine trying about three to play, minutes before. Yeah, yeah imagine mm -hmm. actually trying to play games on um something like a MacBook Air. I know some people have yeah. done it in the past, but um, and it's good for Apple Arcade games and things like that. Like a MacBook Air, the M1 MacBook Air right now is super powerful. You could do a lot of great things with that, but it's not a PC gaming machine, you know. Cool. Mark said that uh, when you were talking about Intel, Mark said that the vendor needs to stop talking about chips and eggs. I'm starving. <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, that's actually chips. how we started talking about uh, chips chips. and all of that stuff. Mm. Everybody get some chips and yeah, fish and chips today, please. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm getting me some blue chips. So. Blue chips. So, okay. uh, Carissa. Are we good to go? Yeah. Everybody. Uh, you, oh, so. yeah. Hmm? Last, last, last <laughs> shout out. I know I say shout out so much, but shout out and hi to yeet, Chris yeet, Reardon, who's here on the chat. Chris Reardon is one of the uh, mentees on Platform Agnostic. Yay. All right. Okay, so Carissa, I just want to make sure that you're all set up and ready to record. Mm -hmm. Or like you actually should all already be recording. Voice memo is all good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, Probably I'm going on. to basically bring us back into the first segment of the show. So everybody watching live, just pretend we are now doing the beginning of the podcast. Forget everything. Okay, yes. the yeah, audio segment, it's all going to be like re, re one. One more thing uh, to yep. say to Carissa. Carissa, can you uh, turn on airplane mode? Because sometimes if you get yes. a call or yes. like, uh, some Please. kind of uh, strange... I have you not disturb, but I'll... I'll yeah, on. yeah, airplane yeah. mode. On your phone, airplane. If you get a call better? or... Well, because no. her is wait is wait hang on is your phone recording through the AirPods because if you turn on airplane mode they'll disconnect no no or does uh, iOS I mean, already prevent that? Well, I mean, the phone yeah the, they're connecting the my AirPods are connected to my laptop and my phone is okay uh, so your okay. phone's yeah. just going yeah, through the mic gotcha yeah that's fine. yeah 
<sighs> okay, we are good to go. Let's talk about some fun stuff. <clears throat> And thanks, Carissa, for joining us. Thank Seriously. You so much, Carissa. Yeah. It's always tough for West Coasters. I know. Okay, no, resetting to fun. the first mm -hmm. segment. Let's do it. All righty. Okay. So let's get into our first segment, uh, specifically how the Biden administration is aiming to bring on big tech critics. And I really just wanted to talk about the news this week that he's going to be nominating the antitrust scholar, Lena Khan, to the FTC. So mm -hmm. to join us and help explain this news uh, for us is senior editor in Gadget, Carissa Bell. Hey, Carissa, how's it going? Hey. Hey. Doing? Happy to have you here, Carissa. Um, and I've followed your coverage for a while when it comes to social media and everything. So I'm wondering, like, have you been following the Lena Khan news? And do you have any, any thoughts about how this administration is thinking about big tech? Yeah, um, I think you know, it's pretty clear. We saw, you know, even when Biden was still just campaigning, like we mm -hmm. knew that he was going to be really critical of tech. You know, he talked a lot about how he didn't like Section 230, how mm -hmm. he wasn't a fan of Facebook. Um, so I think we're really starting to see that kind of play out now uh, with some of these mm -hmm. nominations. Uh, you know, Lena Khan is, is known, you know, she became known in this world uh, after she wrote an antitrust paper about Amazon. You know, she is, you know, these are kind of like really some of the biggest anti- Mm -hmm. tech experts that you can you know be looking for for these positions mm -hmm. uh the thing about lena khan like I, I i wanted to like dedicate a chunk of time to this is because uh she is not your typical le legal scholar right she produced this paper in 2017 uh, a 24,000 word article at the yale law journal called amazon's antitrust paradox in which she deconstructed why we can really think of amazon as a monopoly and that was she was also really young when that happened, right? She was like mm -hmm. 27 or something. She's so just like 32 now. So she's 32 now. Yeah. So I, I just feel really unaccomplished right now whenever I talk <laughs> about young geniuses like this. Yeah. Uh, but her thing, like uh, according to this uh, New York Times profile of her, which everybody should read, um, basically she has this revolutionary idea of rethinking how we think of monopolies because since the 70s um government regulators have thought of companies uh being monopolies if they if they hurt consumers right the focus was on consumer harm um but amazon is a company that's out there providing the lowest prices and really convenient services for everybody um for consumers amazon seems like a great thing all around so how can you call that monopoly how is that unfair her basic argument is that, um, you know, Amazon is, uh, tch, 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 let me let me think of a way to say this. Her basic argument is that uh, Amazon also has its fingers in so many pies. You know, it is, it is dealing with shipping infrastructure, warehouse infrastructure, cloud computing. Um, it is selling products on the same platform where it's selling products from other people. And we've seen a lot of stories where Amazon is basically just looking at some of the most popular products that are being sold and just straight up starts Ripping making it, it themselves for mm -hmm. cheaper. Um, all those seem like bad practices uh, to me. So yeah, where do you stand on this, Krista, and her argument about Amazon as a monopoly? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And it was definitely, you know, I think controversial in sort of these circles of like antitrust law experts. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, yeah, I think basically, you know, her her stance is that, you know, it's just by the, you know, if you kind of think about the sheer dominance of Amazon, you know, the fact that they, they own the market, they're also making their own, you know, competing products, like you mentioned, they also, like you said, they're in all these other businesses, you know, it's kind of impossible for any other company to compete with them. And I think we've sort of seen some of these arguments, you know, play out with some of the antitrust interest we've seen recently, where it's kind of looking at like, how, you know, how, how is Amazon, you know, how is any competitor able to exist when you have a company mm -hmm. that is so dominant, um, can make so much money, they can afford to undercut any competitor, you know? And so, um, so yeah, you know, it definitely is, was sort of considered a, a novel argument, but I mean, I think there's, um, you know, I don't know how you get much more legitimate than the yeah. FTC. It, it does seem like, so yeah, so Biden is nominating her to the FTC, so the Federal Trade Commission, and that would put her in more of a place to directly, you know, speak up against all of these things. Um, but I think in that New York Times profile, one thing she was even calling for was 
for the FTC to actually be able to make to make changes to, you know, maybe not to laws, but to the way businesses are run. Because right now, I believe a lot of things have to get congressional approval. Uh, the FTC has been kind of defanged over the years. And certainly a lot of these big companies do not want more federal oversight. You know, Amazon has succeeded because it's managed to flout a lot, a lot of like, you know, a lot of things. Uh, we, we've seen the news about Be uh, Jeff Bezos not paying that much in taxes. We don't know, uh, in general, corporations pay a lot less taxes proportionally compared to people. Um, Amazon has succeeded, you know, based a lot on uh, pushes by the federal government too. Uh, and one interesting thing uh, for anybody who's not been like following Amazon closely, they don't really report profits that much because they work in this weird model where they take the money they're earning and immediately reinvest it back into the company. So it's kind of a virtuous loop of business growth for them. They just want to be bigger and bigger and bigger. They're not trying to satisfy investors technically, which also makes them a little different from other uh, other companies. Carissa, like, what do you think about this argument when it comes to places like Facebook and Google as well? Like, all these companies dominate in so many ways, and I do think you can make an argument. Like, sure, other social networks exist, but can you really compete against Facebook? Right. I think that's what it comes down to is like, you know, if your business is structured in such a way that it's essentially impossible for anyone else to compete in any meaningful way, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that does cause, you know, harm to, to consumers, even, even indirectly. I mean, I think that's the, the argument that we saw with the, the antitrust suit against Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, it's, um, you know, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how these all play out and if, you know, that kind of legal theory is going to be upheld. Like you said, the FTC has been defanged over the years. You know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, we think very differently about antitrust now than, mm -hmm. you know, obviously like 100 years ago when, uh, you know, there was a much different kind of point of view. Um, you know, but I think there really is this real question of like, you know, should, you know, three, four companies be able to control basically everything? And, you know, is there a line where you can say, okay, well, you know, this, this is too much, you know, and if there is like, where is it? Like, how, mm. how have we not, you know, gotten to that point yet? I can kind of see, like, it almost seems like Lena Khan is calling her shot too. Like at the beginning of that paper, she quotes Ida Tarbell, um, yeah. who's like, who's reporting took down Standard Oil a hundred years ago. That is, if you wonder where the name Rockefeller comes from, you know, or why the Rockefellers are very, very rich and well-known around New York, um, she helped take down the way uh, John Rockefeller uh, did his business, right? And helped to, her reporting helped the government basically break up Sandra Doyle. So it seems like she's thinking of Amazon along the same lines. I'll also mention um, in the news too recently, we saw that Tim Wu, the professor who created the term net neutrality, is also joining the Biden White House. He'll serve on uh, the Economic Council, I believe, and he's basically going to be a special advisor. Um, this is a guy that I've also followed for a while too, because he has been thinking about the way we distribute internet access or you distribute our tech in general. Net neutrality is a term that basically refers to um, making sure that ISPs cannot change or control the way certain traffic is handled on their system. So, uh, and I'll say here that we are owned by Verizon and Verizon has not, you know, has not always been the biggest supporter of net neutrality. I don't think any ISP has been, but more and more we're seeing too, like uh, AT&T and other companies, like now that they're joining with other, with other conglomerates, like they can offer things like discounts to Disney or discounts was AT&T's other service. It's HBO Max, I guess, right? Like it's all Warner yeah. Media. Um, yeah, they can announce that. Um, they can make it so that your, you know, bandwidth from one service does not eat into your monthly bandwidth cap because it's a white labeled service or something, which again sounds kind of good for consumers, but on the whole is very bad for the state of the internet and the way we regulate these uh, you know, these things. I have you followed Tim Woodall, Carissa, because he has been doing this work for a very long time too. Yeah, I have. Um, he also wrote a, a fascinating book called The The Attention Merchants. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, all about sort of, uh, I guess what we now would call like the attention economy of like how, how companies kind of keep us sort of hooked on, on their services and, and stuff like that. And, um, and yeah, and he's obviously like very uh, uh, known on antitrust and, and net neutrality and, and these other important issues. 
Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what do you think these moves, like between Tim Wu coming back, because he was actually, uh, he was part of the Obama administration's mm -hmm. economic council too. He's also publicly admitted that uh, they could have done more to really uh, be stronger with antitrust or push against antitrust, especially when it comes to a lot of mergers. Like yeah. the whole big tech implosion or you know rise happened during the Obama administration, right? It was post the 2008 uh, economic crisis. It was as startups were blowing up, uh, people, you know, Facebook acquired Instagram for a billion dollars and then to like ramp that up completely with WhatsApp and everything. Um, I feel like he is also taking the learnings from, I don't know, they just didn't push hard, hard enough there. What do you think, uh, the moves both for Tim Wu and Lena Khan, like, what do you think it means for the next four years of policy does it have an impact mm -hmm. on the next 10 years? Is it different than the way we've been thinking about big tech over the last decade? I think it definitely could. I think, you know, the, the main thing is that, you know, these are really serious people who, who know their stuff very deeply. You know, they're sort of, you know, mm -hmm. what I want to think of it's, you know, sort of wonkish people that really understand the, you know, the policies, but also have like a deep understanding of how these companies operate, you know, mm -hmm. what the issues are. I think, you know, in the past, that's kind of been one difference is if you look at maybe, um, you know, in the the past, the way that the, the government maybe looked at these kinds of deals is, you know, without the sort of deep understanding of like what these companies' business models were, how, For you sure. know, what those sort of downstream effects were. <laughs> um, so like, yeah, sure. Like Google's great company, you know, that seems fine. Um, whereas, you know, I think now you have people who kind of understand the whole picture. So, you know, I think if you are an executive at one of these companies, you're probably starting to, um, to notice and you know i would think be be a little bit worried about you know where these where this could go yeah i mean we've seen was it over the past couple of years we've seen antitrust hearings uh where the government has basically brought in big tech and i think a lot of those chats have just been outright embarrassing in some respects like a lot of it was republicans saying like what why are you censoring us when all the data shows they're not <laughs> yeah um, always. but also older folks asking for phone help basically um <laughs> Yeah, just a little disappointing. And a lot of Democratic politicians, like they weren't perfect either, but at least they were trying to like hold the feet, hold these companies' feet to the fire mm -hmm. a little bit. And it was Facebook, um, Google, and everybody just couldn't really, didn't really know how to take it. Uh, what is happening today? Because I know Jack Dorsey, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sunder Pichai uh, are going to be testifying before the House Energy and Commerce Committee. We're going to be covering that in Engadget and on our YouTube channel. So once the stream is over, if you're following us live, go check that out. Um, what is happening today? How is it different from last year's uh, antitrust hearings? Yeah, so this hearing is uh, about social media's role in misinformation during the election and during the pandemic. And I think kind of the really crucial thing here is that um, this is the first time that obviously these CEOs have been in front of Congress yeah. several times now. Um, this is the first time that that's happening since the January 6th um, insurrection at the Capitol, which we now know we have a much fuller understanding of like the, the role that, um, you know, companies like Facebook played in those events. So I think it's going to be definitely the tension I think will be even higher. Um, you know, like you said, obviously it's always a little bit of a circus when these CEOs get in front of Congress, <laughs> you know, I'm sure, uh -huh. um, the Republicans want to know why, why Donald Trump was banned. Um, you know, why? I, I don't know why <laughs> I have no reason to really point to that. Yeah. Um, How does... isn't... sorry, I, 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 I saw yesterday, it sounded like Zuck had a proposed change to, to make to section 230 that he might bring up later today. Is that true, Carissa? Oh yes, he um, you know, as a, he had uh, some, what did he call it like a thoughtful reform of Section Two Thirty, <laughs> um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which uh, he he is basically proposing that you know rather than um, you know take it away completely, that companies should basically be required to have some kind of moderation practice in place, and you know what what exactly that looks like can be um, you know set by some some third party. Um, that basically says, you know, if you're a company, you have some, you know, so, so, sort of system in place where if you, you're trying to catch, you know, all of the worst stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, potentially illegal content, you don't have to actually, you won't get punished if you miss something, of course. Um, and uh, so can, can we explain impactful. a bit about what Section 230 is actually? Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah. I think that is important here. Chris, like, how do you, how do you think of Section 230? How would you describe it to our listeners? 
Yeah, I mean, the easiest way is that it's a, a part of a 1996 law that basically gives, uh, says that tech companies, internet companies, internet platforms uh, can't be legally liable for what their users do on their platform. So it's kind of, you know, a really, uh, it's considered a really foundational mm -hmm. uh, law of the internet, that, you know, as we know it, because basically allows, you know, a company like, like Google to, you know, create an open platform and let people kind of uh, make a bit of what they want without sort of having to worry about, you know, every little thing that people say, and whether or not they're going to get sued over it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. And I think what's been ironic, too, is that basically the past few years have been a lot of like conservative and Republican politicians saying we got to we got to remove Section 230. It is harming everything where they have a fundamentally, I'd argue, a fundamentally misunderstood, like they, they are not really understanding how this works. Because if there was no Section 230, there would be no comments on web pages. There would be no, <laughs> yeah. like, there would be no Twitter. There would be no Facebook because you can't actually produce content or you can't let users produce content because you would be legally liable for it. What, where do you think their argument stands against Section 230? I mean, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Like that's kind of been the the huge irony of it all. They say that, you know, um, Section 230 needs to go away, which by the way, it's not just Republicans saying that. I mean, Joe Biden yeah, was yeah. pretty vocal about, about that as well. Yeah. But it's, you know, also that would eliminate, you know, everybody's, um, you know, especially if you think about like Trump and, and all the issues around, you know, that kind of speech, um, you know, there's no way that companies would be able to give uh, somebody like that a, a platform without Section 230. Mm-hmm. There would be a lot of censorship, probably. It basically. Would, yeah, it would, you, it would basically be all censorship, right? Like there would be yeah. no reason as a business why you would let anybody say something on your platform mm -hmm. without like a contract and without like yeah, saying, right. like, okay, you're working for me now and I can, I, I have like some control I'll over vet what you're everything doing. you say. And if you say the wrong thing, you're off. And it exactly. doesn't matter what you think the wrong thing is. I decide what, <laughs> well, yeah, basically. Any, yeah. Anyway. Do you think, um, I mean, Chris, uh, mm -hmm, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think, you know, at the same time, I think there is like a valid argument on the other side that like, well, maybe, you know, companies should, you know, shouldn't be able to just say, well, Section 230 lets us do whatever we want. And mm -hmm. we have no, you know, greater responsibility. But I think, you know, the, the really hard part right now is like trying to figure out where that line is, yep. you know, what, what they should be responsible for, what they shouldn't, you know, obviously, like, there's huge disagreements um, on all sides on that. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I read the Zuckerberg thing too about him like proposing, hey, maybe we can make a stronger Section 230, right? Yeah, something that <laughs> requires moderation. But I also felt like, huh, why are, why are you doing this? Why are you coming out here volunteering this uh, this little bit of oversight? And it kind of makes me feel like the way I did when we were talking about Google and the way they're basically not going to track you anymore for future <laughs> ads, right? Mm -hmm. It seemed like he was anticipating even stronger regulatory moves. How do you feel about his proposal? Do you think, like, would that be enough to really help a lot of the problems of misinformation, um, you know, and uh, and hate speech and things like that that we're seeing online? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, if he's saying that every company should be like Facebook, right? Like, yeah. You know, Facebook has, you know, every chance they get, they talk about, you know, they have this army of content mm -hmm. moderators. They've invested in AI. They've spent billions of dollars, you know, ramping up their systems on all these issues so he's basically saying every company should have to do some version of what we're doing um which would be great for them because then they wouldn't have to change anything about how they operate <laughs> um you know but as, as we've seen with facebook like you know they have all these systems they've spent billions of dollars and you know there's still a lot of really bad stuff that they don't catch um so i don't know that just having more content moderators mm -hmm. which you know by the way there's a whole nother conversation about like um you know, what it's actually like to be one of these people who yep. has that kind of job yep. and the, the ethics of that. But, you know, I'm not, you know, I think that it's been pretty clear at this point that we, it's like not an issue, you know, misinformation and hate speech and all these things. Like you can't just moderate your way out of it um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can't AI your way out of it, at least not, not yet and probably not anytime soon. I like that quote. That's pretty much it. You can't um, AI your way out of it. <laughs> yep. Or moderate your way out of it. That's uh, yeah. that's pretty perfect. Any closing thoughts, Carissa, in terms of what you're expecting or maybe what you'd like to see from when it comes to how we're thinking about these tech companies? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, for me, it's always just the the more, I think the more specific that we can, that, you know, when you watch, whether you're watching like the hearing or some of these proposals, I think sort of like 
it's all like the more detailed we get, the more useful these kinds of conversations are. You know, I think we're all used to seeing kind of politicians get up there and they have their three minutes or five minutes or whatever it is to like question some of these people. And they're just kind of airing like broad complaints about why they hate it and, you know, maybe mm-hmm. trying to like make it a nice soundbite, but actually sort of like the most like meaningful um, moments in these like tends to come when people can get kind of really drill down into the specifics, like have a good understanding like what the issues are and like try to, you know, force an answer because, um, you know, too often, you know, they can kind of, you know, these, you know, these people have been uh, trained very hard on like how to not answer questions. So sort of the more that, you know, we, we can see them actually kind of trying to like nail down some of these people and like get real, real answers from them on their, their policies, why they are the way they are. I think that's at least going to help move the conversation because I think you know sort of just having these hearings doesn't necessarily accomplish anything other than sort of you know uh getting a lot of good uh sound bites for uh, c-span <laughs> exactly exactly uh Sherlyn, anything else you want to add here yeah mm-hmm. um I, I I think that compared to and I don't it's been a while since we talked about the Trump advisory council but I remember mm-hmm. Elon Musk being one of the people on there and the selection now on Joe Biden's part, not for his advisory council, but just the people he's choosing to put in places where, you know, they can have uh, an impact with what they do, Tim Wu and Lena Khan, being not people from within the tech industry, being more critics of it is is so much better because people like Elon Musk have a vested interest in, hmm. you know, shaping things a certain How way. How has his online like, speech been, too? Like, hmm. <laughs> You know, uh, <laughs> so 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 I think it's interesting to see, he, he, you know, the, the choice of academics, critics, people who are very familiar and well versed in the industry and how to work it, but are not like they're not invested in it that way. They're not like a big part of it. Their their livelihood, their profit margins, and everything is not from tech doing well. You know, so mm-hmm. that's to me what's heartening to see. Um, from all these choices and, and kind of come, brings us back to like that original topic of why the Biden admin wants tech critics because that would be fairer, I think, for the general population. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to wrap the segments. Uh, Chris, just stick around for a bit. We'll do some Q&A if we have time okay. and then we will finish up the live stream by 1130. Okay. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Chris Abel, thank you so much for joining us in the Gadget Podcast. Where can we find you on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, just uh, my name and B. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's going to be fun. And uh, yeah, for everybody joining us live right now, stay tuned to, Eng- to the Engadget YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be airing the congressional hearings um, or the oversight hearings at noon Eastern. And um, yeah, check out our coverage on Gadget.com. Let's do you a little bit of Q&A. All right. All right. Q&A time. Well, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the, the chat and the... Um, conversation that we've had uh, kind of went parallel. People were mm-hmm. talking a lot about like PC hardware and such um, <laughs> while we were talking about like tech policy because uh, so it goes. I, I expect so that. It, yeah. yeah, so it goes and also like it's hard to say anything concrete because there are really no concrete proposals quite yet, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there are some people who think that uh, Section 230, uh, what was this one? one? One comment said tech companies are applying censorship. Section 230 allows them to censor as they wish instead of uh, needing to moderate morally. So, I mean, no. people have a lot hmm. of different opinions about. Um, yeah. What's straight up, that's here. wrong. That That is. That is not the way it's working. Yeah. But that is just yeah. to say that th- yep. as long as the waters are murky, um, people mm-hmm. are you know, going to think whatever they think. Mm-hmm. And I think people only are only end up really um, figuring out how they feel once there is solid policy proposal on the table. And we don't have sure. that. Yep. So we're, we're we talking we about an sure. upcoming conversation. Yep. Uh, I, I think why I'm so interested in this is just because it feels like, hey, we have grownups at the table um, who know what's happening, right? Who can like really just say, hey, like this is the problem. These are some potential fixes. We don't know. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. We don't know what the market effects of changing regulations on some of these companies are, but we kind of do know how these companies are affecting competition, how they're affecting speech online. You look at Facebook, right? And 
all throughout the aftermath of the 2016 election, it was Zuckerberg and people saying, we had no effect on this election, none at all. There was no Russian inter interference. A couple of years later, we see the stories where Facebook knew exactly that people were trying to, you know, do something with the U.S. Uh, election using its service and basically just denied that and hit that. And to me, that seems like the bigger problem. You know, like these, we've built these things uh, through the power of algorithms and uh, the attention-seeking economy. We've built these things to basically destroy our civilization, not to get too overblown, but <laughs> that's kind of what, when you have a service with over 2 billion users and the Facebook doesn't know how to control the power of its platform, it leads to things like the the undermining of democracy in a way. Um, quick question, and I hope this doesn't feel too weird, Kuversa, because mm -hmm. it it is a video live stream after all. People are curious about your background. Is there a mirror or do yeah. you have two of those clocks? Oh, yes, there is like, there's a, um, <laughs> a next to like a closet. So it's like yes. a closet door. <laughs> what I thought, but it's a very nice yeah. clock. Yeah. Very nice. It looks marble. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are you, yeah. How are, how are you holding up, Krista? Because I also feel like every time we video chat with you, you're stuck in your room. And I wonder like, mm -hmm. are you are you able to get outside? Can you work anywhere else? uh i haven't yeah we haven't had much chance to chat over the year yeah uh well it's pretty exciting i'm uh, i'm actually uh at my my mom's house this nice. uh this week in southern california so it's been uh really nice that's why i have a new room behind me and yeah um, i've even uh, been able to like set up a little backyard office a couple days this week so Aww. it's been uh it's been really nice. california weather allows that like North yep. East, love it, love it. i got sunburned really the other day so oh, wow <laughs> yeah, that's a flex yeah <laughs> i love it work outside if you can folks safely yeah, yeah it's great <laughs> do well, we have any I other questions rest... to jump into? yeah yeah the rest of the chat seem to be talking about uh vr chat and how uh, what gaming culture sometimes is like um and mark dell you know points out that he is just generally trying to detox from politics if, even if he knows he shouldn't and that he knows is important um which you know fair enough if you need a mental health break from yeah. anything really just do it um definitely okay well maybe we should just wind down now because our video folks have to go work on the hearing coverage yeah too. that's true when we do video coverage or video credits okay thank you yeah. folks for joining us everybody yeah yeah so... we, we see you and uh did we want to shout out some names before we go or sure sure, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just welcome to new reg new viewer dan's brick man is again and our regulars like mark dell daniel cockane i saw that uh we had bryant mitchell here for a second uh sir holmes is another name i think is fairly familiar ben interacts with you guys a bit more nowadays too so i'm sure you know more of the names than i do uh i think you did a pretty good job there's arthur ls uh you know i'm not sure the weird thing is that we're never sure if we're shouting at people who've already left so yeah that's also you know, that's also the other thing yep. but you're so much better at uh general live stream etiquette than i am because i mean <laughs> I'm just trying it's to a, be nice. It's a whole, That's all. <laughs> it's a whole different thing. Mark <laughs> Dell said to Carissa, "Glad you got to visit your mom and see your family." Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. So, yeah, there we got some nice people in the chat. We do. Yeah, uh, it's very wholesome for a live live stream. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice here. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, we have to give our video team some time to switch over to covering the um, the the uh, testimony. So. <laughs> Thank you to our video team. The stream comes to you via our via them, which is led by Kyle Mock with Owen Davidoff, Julio Barrientos, and Luke Brooks. But it's powered by everyone in the chat saying nice things about um, about what we have to say, and sometimes the fact that we get to visit our moms. Um, <laughs> If you stuck around this long, rate the show on iTunes. Come on. We were just talking about how we live in <laughs> algorithms. Please. Um, it really helps other people find the show. It Tell helps. your friends. Yep. Helps all good. everything that we're doing. Um, and we'll see you next week. Later, folks.